Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Holler if you can't. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I really am. Amy, thank you. They've been absolutely wonderful setting everything up. Um, as she said, I usually teach college people composition. So it's a real treat to get adults. Why is it a real treat? Well, <laughs> you're not talking. I don't have to tell you to pull out your earbuds. You don't have distracting writing and you're not eating. So thank you. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a good night, I can tell. All right, so before I start in with my speech, I wanna focus your attention on the photograph up here. Why is that? Well, part of the difficulty about writing this book is that the information is all over the place. And it took me, you probably read like 10 years to get this. Now my friends tell me it would have been shorter if I knew what I was doing and they have a point. But it did take me a long time because it wasn't located any one place. It was located in a lot of different places. And I almost didn't get this published because I needed 181 <laughs> pictures. And I had a lot of pictures, but I didn't have all of the pictures over the course of the, um, the length of the prison that was open. And I scratched and I looked and I thought, I, this book is just never gonna get written. But then one day I was looking at a picture and I'm always looking for the attribution. And this one said, um, Washington Navy Yard, Washington DC. So I called, as I usually do, I called the archivist and I said, I have a picture here from, from your Navy Yard. Do you have any more? And there was a silence at the, at the end of the file. He said, funny you should mention that. We just pulled out that file. It's a big file. <laughs> Every cell in my body started to vibrate. And he said, we're digitizing the collection. And we just pulled it out. But he said, no one's ever looked at it. And all the time I've been here, no one's looked at this collection. In fact, he said, I think it's been here 30 years and no one's looked at these photographs. And furthermore, he says, we don't know what we're looking at. We know that there are pictures of all the commandants and I'm like, well, how can I get my hands on this? But the rest we know kind of, we know what the prison looks like, but all the rest we don't. And because of that, we're just gonna throw it out. <laughs> I, he probably meant deaccession it, but that's what he said. And I you know, don't scream over the phone, but that's where <laughs> that's kind of where I was. Don't do that, I said to him. So I told him about what I was doing. And so we struck a bargain. He said, I, "There's no way I can get these to you. There's hundreds of pictures." He said, "You're going to have to come down." I said, "All right." And he said, um, "I said if you let me scan them, I will identify for identify them for you, and then you can decide whether you want to digitize them or not." And that's so. I took my flatbed scanner and I went down to Washington D.C. and I spent two days down there scanning and and labeling all these pictures. And you'll be happy to know that we saved the collection, <laughs> and that's how I got this picture. Yeah, it was. So yeah, I ended up with like a thousand pictures of the, wow. of, the, of the prison. All right, so before I go on to the next slide, I'm gonna ruin your evening for a minute. Tell you what's not true. Can you hear, can you hear me? I do. Can you, so I'm not mic'd here in the room? Whoa, I'll talk louder. <laughs> All right, so where was I? Oh, I'm, I'm gonna bust some myth, myths. People escaped from the prison. So that thing, yeah, that was, a, that was a shocker for me too. Uh, you know, that thing that says brought back dead or alive, dead or alive, not true. And I'm gonna tell you about one of those people. Humphrey Bogart was never there, I am sorry. <laughs> he didn't get that scar from taking a prisoner to Boston. I don't know where that came from. I read a couple of biographies. They, he, they don't even mention Portsmouth in, in Humphrey Bogart's biographies. Walt Disney was not there either, ever. And the 
the architecture of the castle of the prison has nothing to do with Disneyland or Disney World or any of that. Darn. It's not a toxic site. Yeah, I know. It had asbestos in it. And so uh, hanging on to the prison is dicey because it is difficult. Um, but the land on which it's on is not a toxic shock uh, site. Um, if you saw the last detail, I don't know if you, any of you saw that picture, and they take you to the prison at the very end. Well, that was a Hollywood set that wasn't the prison. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I think that's all. Oh, yeah, I have a couple more. Um, they said that if you lost a prisoner while you were on duty, had to serve out the term, you hear that one? Not true. If they left the deadline and when you were on duty, uh, you had to serve out their term. Not true. So I think that's all of the ones that I have. Oh, one more. Somebody said that, was it true that when men were in the uh, cell block that when the tide came in, it came up to their necks. I don't know if you've heard that one. Well, it isn't true necessarily because there were no solitary confinements until after World War II. Um, you can't do that if you're in the cell block, but in the lower reservation and in little Siberia, maybe. Um, so that's all my bad news for the night. The rest of it's all great. All right, so moving right along. Moving right along. Why is this not working? Here we go. That's the book. So you're probably wondering how in the world I got involved in this topic. And you probably see uh, this causeway uh, on the way. You probably know it, the, the road on the way. And one day, it was, like was kind of like this summer day. I was traveling with a friend of mine, and he was from the Army, actually. And I had lived in Portsmouth area for about a decade, and he was born in the state. So we're driving, but you know where this is. This is the causeway that goes by. And we get by it, and, that, and, the, and the prison comes up. And I turned to him, and I, I had never seen that before. I'd seen the annex, but I thought it was a warehouse. I'd never seen this before. So I turned to him, and I said, what's that? And of course, what he wanted to say was, how can you be you know, so ignorant and not aware of what's going on around you? But bless him, he did not. He said, that's the Portsmouth Naval Prison, the worst of the worst. And then he got talking to me about the submarines, eventually the German submarines. I had just graduated from journalism school and I had done my master's degree about William Lawrence, who was the only, he was a science writer for the New York Times and he was the only writer that could talk about the atomic bomb. And they hijacked him basically. Um, so when I finished graduate school, and I had just finished graduate school, um, I was steeped in World War II. So when he said something about the uh, submarines, my ears perked up. And I thought three things. One was, if I don't know about this prison, I bet there's a lot of other people who don't either. And two, oh, I can just research this. And three, there's probably a whole bunch of stories here. Well, one in three were true. And two, if I know then what I was going to get into, I may have found another topic. There was a whole other issue, which I will get into. All right. So what I realized really quickly was that I knew nothing about the Navy, and I knew nothing about prisons. And so I had to start from the absolute beginning. And so if you know all this and you know about military law, and I apologize, but this was kind of, this was right at the very beginning. And what I learned was that as soon as you put men in boats and probably women, um, they had, they developed rules. And the bigger the boat, the more people in the boat, the more rules they had. So way back, the Punic Wars, I guess, the Romans, had these boats and they had, well, it says they had an oral tradition of uh, the, the laws that went along with these boats. These were the ones that waged war. And as you can see, there are a lot of people and, and the need for discipline and order was clear because what do they wanted to do? They wanted to wage war and you had to get everybody organized to do that. 
So those guys had a system. I'm sure a lot of other people had a system as well, but the people who finally codified it, of course, no surprise here, were the British because they ruled the waves. And they wrote it all down and they were real good at it. They were good at uh, discipline. They were good at meeting out punishment. They were good at just about everything having to do with ships and men and laws. We, so this says, yeah, they revised it. We, when we separated from England, we took the, those laws and we made them our own and we adapted them for us. We renamed them Rocks and Shoals just because it was easier. So currently, Articles 1 and 2 and the Fifth Amendment, probably many of you already know this, are, is, are define the status of military law in the Constitution. And so it's different. So their law is different from our laws and they do different stuff, which is why we needed a prison. Well, that's half of it. I'll get to the other half in a second. One of the ways they kept discipline way back was physical discipline. And why did they do that? Ships, particularly, if you've ever been on an old ship, there isn't any room. And if you did it physically, supposedly, it was effective and it was quick and you could get people back to work because they needed all hands on deck all the time. But these people would go back to land every once in a while <clears throat> and they would talk about what was going on in the ship. And so it was kind of arbitrary who did what to whom. And so the army banned this in 1850. The, um, the Navy did in 1850, the army did in 1810. It took for that reason, it took the Navy a long time to do that. And when they finally did it, the ship's captains were really upset. They said, discipline is just going to hack. We can't do our, we can't um, discipline the men. We can't do our ships. This is just really bad. We need to do something about this. And what happened, all right. So because they had to look for something, they, they started looking for actual prisons. And while they were doing that, they just kept them pretty much in brigs and places and harbors wherever they stopped. But they did start looking for a spot for a, a naval prison. So I'm gonna do a segue here for a minute and, and give you a short geography orientation, which you already probably know. This is an old picture and it talks about that at least eight rivers empty into Portsmouth Harbor and into the Piscataqua River. And so it's one of the fastest navigable uh, waters in the country. And the tides are ferocious. And anybody thinking they're going to get from here to there, starting at the end of the prison, generally don't. And I think that's one of the reasons that the prison was put where it was. So it is an estuary where the um, salt and the fresh water meet one another. This is, now I actually have a, here we go, right there is the shipyard. This was before the prison was built. So it is there, you kind of can see it from a, a different angle. And this is an aerial view. How do I know this is an aerial view in 1930? Well, I go and show you where the prison is, which is right over here, can I see this? Yes, right here. So there's the administration building and one wing and behind it is the lower reservation. The lower reservation wasn't built until World War I. Um, so you can kind of tell that this is, uh, I'm sorry, it was, World, it was World War I, so this was after <laughs> World War I, but the other wing wasn't built until World War II. So it's kind of, can tell you how, where this, when this was taken. So this gives you a picture of, and you can see that you have to go all the way through the shipyard to get to the prison. Somebody was thinking, who was that somebody? I will tell you. In order to make sense of how we got there, I have to tell you about the Spanish-American War, which you probably have some notion of, remember the main, that kind of thing. So the Spanish-American War was essentially that the Americans and the Spanish both wanted Cuba. And 
the Americans had, well, after the Maine exploded, which they thought was, was rigged by the Spaniards, we started to wage war on Spain and Cuba. And we amassed our ships outside Havana Harbor, which is kind of a semicircle with a very small opening. Admiral Severa, who was head of the Spanish ships, knew that sooner or later he was going to have to go into that harbor because he had to fuel up. He needed coal. So he waited for a really long time, and the American ships outside the harbor were waiting for him. But one night he did, and he darted into the harbor. <clears throat> and when he did, the Americans were alerted that Cervera's ships were in the harbor. And Admiral Sampson, who was the admiral of the American ships, said, I don't know whether he said, who would like to, or don't you think you ought to? But a guy by the name of, now I will tell you this, Richmond Pearson Hobson. I don't know who would name anybody that, but that was his name. But either volunteered or was volunteered. <clears throat> and what he decided to do was to take the ship called the Merrimack, which was a collier, and turn it into an explosive, he, he, he put a whole bunch of explosives and mines in this thing. He was an explosive expert. He had five of his buddies who also volunteered. <clears throat> and what they were gonna do is to go into the, the small part of the harbor and bottle up the Spaniards in the harbor. So they waited a couple of nights until it was really, really dark and they took the, the Merrimack and they went in, in there. And of course, nothing ever happens like it's supposed to happen, but <clears throat> it, it depends whose version you read. It either exploded or it didn't explode, but it spread all of this stuff all over the harbor. But the other thing that it did was that it allowed the uh, mines to float. He had rigged this up so that he could mine the harbor. The harbor hadn't been mined. <clears throat> but what happened was he had a catamaran where he was, they were supposed to escape. And in the explosion, that no longer was available for them to escape. So it's the middle of the night, <clears throat> they're hanging on to something and they were in there for a while and all of a sudden dawn breaks and they hear Spanish people in boats and they think, okay, this is it, we're dead. <clears throat> they come up alongside of them and they are so surprised by what had happened. They are just blown out of the water. It's like, <clears throat> they said something like, this is amazing. You guys were valiant. There, this, and who was in that boat but Admiral Cervera? And he probably saw the handwriting on the wall. He's thinking, there's no way we're getting out of this harbor. So he took the five guys <clears throat> and brought them up to Castle Morrow and kept them there. The next morning, all of the Spanish ships had to go single file past the Merrimack to avoid the mines and all of the debris. And the Americans just shot them and we just uh, sank them basically, one at a time. It, it was like ducks in a pond, whatever. And they were completely sunk. He did spend some time trying to resurrect them later on, but that's another story. So later there was a prisoner exchange and um, Lieutenant Hobson was exchanged with some Spanish prisoners. But the, the uh, American press was really, really interested in this. And so they were following Hobson and what happened. And when Hobson came back, they interviewed him and he said, Admiral Cervera treated us wonderfully. He was great. He spoke English quite well, actually. And um, the, the newspaper man broadcast this from coast to coast. And Lieutenant Hobson became the hero of Spanish-American War. And he was like Lindbergh. Everywhere he went, there are all kinds of people. And the same thing happened to Cervera, that he said, this is like, I'm the hero of this war wherever he went. Everybody was saying, oh my gosh, you treated the Americans so well. And this is, you know, this could have ended up horribly. What does that mean? That meant that they had 1,600 uh, Span Spanish seamen and a whole slew of officers that they didn't know what to do with because they got them like in a second. None of the, uh, none of the, uh, up the establishments up and down the, the coast had any room for them. However, 
Um, John Long was Secretary of the Navy, and he was from Maine. And he knew apparently the area. He said, I know just the place. So 1,600 uh, Spanish prisoners steamed up the coast and stopped in Ware CV Island. And what did they do there? Um, first, they put them in American garb because they were, they were raggedy and sick and this. And so they put them in our uniform. And that was one of the first things they said. You'll see a little kid here in the front. And at first, I thought that was the son of the photographer, but I, I learned later on as I was reading that there had been a 12-year-old boy on ship because he had been, um, his parents had been killed and there's no place to go, so they put him on the ship and he came here. Um, I'm not sure what happened to him. The Red Cross came and took very, very good care of these. They paroled all of the surgeons and all the medics and everybody who could help. And they uh, nursed a whole bunch of them back to health. They lost 16, 18 maybe, and they buried them on the, uh, in, in the shipyard. Eventually took them back. This is Admiral Sampson and Admiral Cervera on the shipyard in, in the administrative building. So they built um, this stockade for the prisoners and they built it on CV Island, the spot where the prison is currently sitting. And technically this always says they built it in 48 hours. Now my brother edited my book, not once, but twice. And he said to me, you can't build anything like that for 1600 people, etc., in 48 hours. It must've been 48 days. I said, they only stayed there three months. So it had to be not 48 days. So somewhere between 48 hours and 48 days, they built this incredible stockade. And they brought in the Marines from having fought and from uh, the brig up in Boston. And if you're a Marine and you know anything about Marines who have earned a lot of, no, uh, not notoriety, but uh, awards, medals, whatever, you know the name of Smedley Butler, and Smedley Butler was the most decorated Marine ever. And he is in the third, second row and the third one from the right. And we'll be talking about him later, but he was a young pup here. And many of these people went on to have really pretty good careers. They stayed in tents, they stayed elsewhere. And eventually they, uh, the ship came to bring um, the, deceased Spaniards back to Spain. Cervera, when the Spaniards left, there was a big thing. He went and said goodbye to everybody. Everybody came down. Interestingly enough, there were a whole bunch of pictures of Spaniards. I could have filled the whole book with pictures of Spaniards, and I never understood that. Why was that? It seems that Kodak, go figure, had just produced something that you could take pictures with. And so all the women in the area came down with their Kodak cameras and the prisoners were posing and everybody had a wonderful time. And as a result, there are a gazillion photographs of the Spanish prisoners. This is the monument on the shipyard grounds, which has been moved a couple of times that talks about the fact that they were there. And they had pretty well decided at that point that they were going to put the prison where the Spaniards had been. They decommissioned it all, the, that fortress, the stockade, they took it apart. And, but then people thought, all right, this might work. And while they were thinking about building the prison, they housed them in two ships that they, both of them, I think, were, had transport ships or colliers or something, Southery and the Topeka, and they put them in uh, the back channel and they brought prisoners and kept them there. And then they started to build the prison. When they started to build the prison, the, the main people were uh, Bureau of Yards and Docks. They were the people who, generally speaking, had the, uh, the planes. We didn't have a lot of money back when they started to do this. And so part of the problem was that it was, an, it was built in fits and starts. They built it when they had money and they didn't when they didn't. And I really felt sorry for this horse because you can see his ribs. So this is the uh, cell block. 
one of the things that I found really, really interesting about the prison when they built it was that they were on the cutting edge in terms of um, doing innovative things. They, they did a lot of very unusual things that nobody else had done. One of them was they used the Auburn system, which is um, an island of cages. So they're like four tiers and they're on an island. You'll see a picture of that in a minute. And that came from Auburn, New York, and where, that, where that first prison, where that prison was also um, heralded as somebody who had um, looked at innovation and embraced it. The other thing they did was they took um, from the Elmira, I think it was a boys school, and they categorized boys as they came in. And so they knew what program they should be in and they knew what kind of services they need. And so the uh, prison, when it first opened, opened with Kelton as, as the uh, commandant. And so they had the Auburn system. Here's before the cell, here's before the actual cells were brought in. And you'll see that there's windows right and left and there's radiators down there. Well, the thinking was, of course, in there'd be the breezes in the summer and we'd hit it in the winter. Well, neither one of those things really worked very well. So um, part of the hard time of being in this prison was you froze in the winter and uh, you were dying of heat in the summer. There was another problem which made life really miserable and that was they had a water problem. And I had read the Commandant's annual reports which were fascinating. And for, for decades, well, let's see, up until Thomas Mount Osborne, uh, 20s or 30s anyway, they didn't have enough water for drinking, they didn't have enough for washing, they didn't have enough for showering. It was a nightmare. So you can imagine what that, what that was like. So there were three things that, not to mention the fact that maybe you were in cells and maybe you belonged there, but it was hard time. This is a cell block, finally finished. Here's a stand pipe. Yes. I'll try. We are we are in the uh, we are in the cell block, okay. right? I thought from the, the cell block. Yeah, no, and I don't know why those beds are there. It's a really good question. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> They're right next to the radiators. <laughs> They're really good or really bad. All right. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. You didn't want to see all this again. So the standpipe was for water. That, that big long up and down thing was for water. And it, it helped, but they still had a problem until they redid all the electricity and all, and all the water. So this, and they began the administration building even before the, um, the wing was finished. There was a, there's a lot of um, metal work in, in the prison. And interestingly enough, there are uh, many contractors that did work, but one of the largest companies that did it was called Snare and Triest. And they were a company out of New York uh, City, and they were very, uh, very well known, did very well for themselves, both of them. They helped build the Triborough tri -bro Bridge and the Rip Van Winkle Bridge and a whole bunch of other things in New York City. <clears throat> they came up here and did a lot of the scroll work, a lot of the fancy stuff that you see attached to the prison. <clears throat> they eventually broke up. Both of them did very well. They broke up because Snare got the $34 million contract from the government to build the outpost at Guantanamo. And so in a way you can say Snare built parts of two prisons, I guess. And Snare actually stayed in Cuba. He was a big guy down there for a very long time and built a lot of stuff. Trees did just as well um, back in New York City. <clears throat> Many people wonder why this looks like a castle. Why in the world did you build this like a castle? Well, there's two schools of thought. One school of thought is your, your religious um, buildings often look like this. And I think, what was the, what was the thing? The, 
um, the Christian morality of the medieval knights was supposed to rub off on whoever entered the building, kind of like an early feng shui, I suppose. Um, that was one. That was one way of looking at it. The other was it was going to scare you to death that this was really imposing. And if you didn't get it when you walked in there and that cell door slammed, you were not going to get it. So there's two ways. There were two, two ways of looking at it. I don't know whether either one of them worked, but that's what they were thinking. I just put this in because um, there's two outhouses there. I thought that was kind of fun. They're often cows. I just did put in the cow pictures. This is the imposing front door with the electroliers. That's what they were called. And they're still there. They don't work and the glass isn't there, but they're still there. The very first um, commandant who opened it was Kelton. And Kelton had come from um, prison school, as it were. He knew a lot about this, which was true for many of the commandants in the beginning. They came educated and prepared. He had been in, uh, in the war, and this was the end of his tenure. Actually, this is the last thing he did before he retired, was to open the prison, and he did do that. And he set in motion um, the sort of sorting people but the big thing he did is he said, and this was unusual back then, he said, if you keep these people in the cells, they're going to go crazy. We need to give them something to do. And he started them with work detail. And he kept them as busy as he possibly could. And at that time, there wasn't a whole bunch of things to do, but that really set part of the precedent. Again, this is the commandant's building. The commandant actually did have any place to live. He had a place to work, but I couldn't ever find out where he lived. They ran out of room really quickly, so the Marines didn't have any place to go. They put them on the top of the administration building, and this is where they were. You can see their rifles right there. And this is the Marine Guards, and so they, space was a problem, water was a problem, a lot of things were a problem. And this is where they're in their summer dress or summer uniforms. The fourth thing that was really hard and was an innovation at the time, it was a Quaker thing, which is they couldn't talk to each other. That if you wanted to, prisoners wanted to talk to each other, they had to go through the guards. And this was a real hardship. But it was very popular back then. Auburn did this, I think, until 29. I think we stopped it a while ago because it did not exactly allow them to think on their misdeeds. It drove them crazy. And we figured that out fairly quickly at Portsmouth and um, stopped doing that. But it was hard. I mean, you look at the weather and the water and now you can't talk. Uh, when they couldn't talk, they ate silently. They, were, they sat according to their disciplinary status. If they were good people, I guess they got food first and more. I don't know. If they were ne'er-do-wells, they were away in the corner and got the cold potatoes. I don't know. The very first um, outbreak, when somebody tried to break out, was here on the workman's landing. Many people, way in the beginning, before they realized that there was no way you were going to cross this river, um, drowned. When they were in the Southery and the uh, Topeka, they, they jumped ship and they drowned immediately. And they were dragging guys out of the water a lot in the, in the first years. They tried. They hit somebody over the head with a shovel, but they were, they were subdued. The second one that came was, was Leonard. <clears throat> he came from... Um, where did he come from? I think maybe NYU. And he too had been around and was looking, um, was, was very well versed in, in prisons and what would be beneficial to the people who stayed there. But he had fought in the Boxer Rebellion and he lost an arm. So he only stayed there three years and he asked for early retirement because he said, I really can't do my job with one arm. And they agreed. And he went to lawyer school 
And he became a very famous Washington, D.C. lawyer. In fact, when good old Smedley Butler was court-martialed, <laughs> guess who bailed him out? Mr. Leonard. So yeah, he did very, very well for himself, one arm notwithstanding. The next guy, which I don't, I didn't put the picture up, stayed for exactly three months. Um, why did he stay for three months? Well, there was a whole bunch of stuff going on in the Philippines and in Guantanamo and Guam, and they were always taking guys and sending them over there into the hot spots. And that's what happened to Terrell, T-U-R-R-I-L-L. -L. He was from Vermont and he became a Brigadier General. He did very well for himself and they just grabbed him and they sent him to uh, Guantanamo like immediately. So the next guy was Thorpe. Now, maybe it was Thorpe that came from NYU, but anyway, he, <laughs> he turned the place upside down. Well, sort of kind of. He knew about uh, the, the IQ test, he knew about the personality test, he knew about all kinds of sorting of people. And that's what he did. And he sorted these guys according to their height and their weight and their this and their that. And when I read his, and when I read his, his commandant report, I just laughed. Um, I think it was kind of OCD. He had a list for everything. This is, uh, this is the uh, religion of the guys who came in. <clears throat> this is what they said they were in for. And many of them came in because, or left, because they didn't realize they just couldn't go home when, when Aunt Lucy died and left. Um, many of them, I mean, a, a fifth of them were illiterate. Um, yeah, so this was another list. This was the schedule. Notice it's not in military time. Not in military time because we didn't use it yet. So it's, it's a very rigorous day up at 530. Uh, the smoking lamp is when you could smoke and if it wasn't there, you couldn't. So everything went along pretty well until this guy. The progressives had decided that what was going on in prisons was not the greatest thing. And so this was during Prohibition and, and Lucretia Mott, who was a relative of his. And they hired him. He did not have military background, but he came from Harvard. I think it was the only commandant who had had a Harvard education. And he turned the place upside down. He had friends in high places. He had been the commissioner of prisons in New York State. He had been the commandant at Sing Sing and at, at the Auburn prison. He'd been mayor of Auburn. There's a statue of him outside the police station in Auburn. Um, and he knew Franklin Roosevelt, who was the assistant secretary of the Navy, and who bailed him out a lot. When he came, he had the blessing of a lot of people who said, you know, we really need to do something. More than that, however, and World War I was kind of swirling around, and Osborne happened to be at the right place at the right time. And he had this view, and he called it the Welfare League, the Naval Welfare League, and he did this in every place he went. He went undercover, he called himself Tom Brown, and he was a prisoner for a week. And then he came and he wrote a staggering article for the Portsmouth Herald, saying what a horrible place this was, and of course endeared himself to all the Marines immediately, um, and then swept through reforms that he wanted. He got rid of the Marines, he sent them somewhere else in the shipyard, and he let the men rule themselves, essentially. And they had a, a review board and they meted out punishment, and World War I came right about that time. And to his great credit, what, because he, he did not uh, ascribe to the bad seed philosophy, he thought everybody had something good that they can contribute and we can find that, we can use them. Um, I don't think they knew about sociopaths, but they, <laughs> they kind of did them in. But anyway, so he, what did he do? He did a lot of stuff. First of all, he, he built, he built a lower reservation. Um, which I showed you before, he had a lot of stuff. And the houses at the very end were all named for ships. 
and they, you know, the cooks were there and the sewers were there and everybody, everybody had their own place to go. There's a place for people with venereal disease. There's always a place for people with venereal disease. And there was one for African-Americans, go figure. This was, the middle part was the uh, mess hall. And this is the tunnel, they had a concrete tunnel. You can still see part of the tunnel if you go um, on a tour. What else, so this is, this is a picture of the administration building and the, um, and the lower reservation, which is not there anymore. And if you look at it from another angle, you can see finally quarters Q in the back. Where is quarters Q? Right there. And that is the commandant's house. In 1913, they built him a house. And it's still there, and I think it's still being used. So what was, so you get some idea. I'll get out of your way so you can read this. He was one of the first men to restore men to duty. And they really needed that in World War I. They needed it a lot. And he really did change what happened to prisoners. Well, not immediately, and I'll tell you about that. But wherever he went, generally when he left, things eased up for prisoners a bit. Wadhams came right after Osborne and stayed a year or two and kept everything going. And then someone in the administration um, said, you know, uh, we don't know what's going on at the Portsmouth prison, but it's going to end. And Osborne had really done what he wanted to do, no matter what anybody said at the shipyard. And there was a lot of discussion at the shipyard. Nobody, would, not everybody was real happy with this guy. And he had a lot of publicity in all the papers. Everybody knew about him. And finally, he had to leave after three years. Roosevelt couldn't help him anymore. And, and somebody very high up in the government sent this guy. This guy was a son of a judge. And he had marching orders, and his marching orders were crack down. And crack down, he did. He sent, he brought the guards back, and he put everybody back in their cells, and he eliminated whole bunches of stuff that they loved, and they were furious. And if you look, if you read his report, he just has discipline problems up and down. But he did crack down. And not only that, they, in, United States was kind of an economic problem. So he put in a salvage program where you had to mend your uniform. And if you didn't, they, you would be fined or disciplined. And he uh, reduced the, amount, the daily amount devoted to food below the minimum. The, he talked about the temperature. It was the coldest winter ever like 56 below zero, I can't believe that's true. But anyway, needless to say, there was some grumbling going on in the prison. I think the shipyard people loved him. And so did the first, um, the first district because he saved the money, he did. But it should not have been too much of a surprise when not long after one of the most spectacular escapes known to the prison occurred. And probably they got what they needed when, when they were working in, in one of these places. One of the big privileges was you could go and watch movies. They got all of the latest movies. And if you were good, you got to see a lot of movies. And it happened just about this time in the year. And they, they were up in, were they in the administration building, I think so, watching movies. It was a Sunday night, it was nice, everybody was focused on the movie, and these guys found shears and somehow went over to the system, the heat and whatever system, and carved a hole in, the, in all these big pipes, climbed up to the roof, 70 feet up, threw down the rope, 
And all four of them got to the bottom of the administration building. Nobody missed them. They were still watching the movie. They went over to Lieutenant somebody's house, quarters, and he had been married. So they, they took three dresses and his suit, and one of the guys dressed up as a guy, and the other ones dressed up as women. And they stole his Nash Rambler, and they drove out the front gates of the shipyard. Nobody missed them until like the next morning. And then by then they're in Connecticut. But if you, if you had been living in Portsmouth at the time, if, if these guys um, left or there was an escape, it was, it was really hard because they closed down everything. The roads were closed down. There was a dragnet, there were dogs, there was the police, there were all the Marines out. Um, it was a big deal. And the sirens raged and everybody hated them. And nothing happened. If you were going to uh, Hampton to the beach, you didn't get there because everything was closed down until they find these guys. Well, they didn't find these guys. And it hit the papers. And it was like a soap opera. So for four days, these guys were on the loose. And they were having a high old time in Connecticut. Sunday morning, um, they ran out of gas. And so they went to the gas station and they helped themselves. And the guy came out and said, you're going to pay for this. And they put a gun in, in the face and said, well, what are you going to do about it? And took off. It wasn't him necessarily that turned them in. As they sped through the streets of wherever they were, um, some policemen noticed them speeding and didn't pull them over, but gave chase. And so there's this big car chase all over whatever town they were in. And finally they shot the gas tank out and they were caught. They were put in the local jail for quite some time before anybody realized where they were supposed to be. Finally, they got them back to the prison and they hauled them in front of South. And South looks at them and says, what were you thinking, basically? And one of them said, it looked like it might be a good shot. <laughs> it might pay off. And actually, exactly four years later, one of those guys uh, escaped again. It was Frank O'Neill and fled into the night, never to be found again. So for him, this was a dry run. Uh, for everybody else, they, you know, they had, they had their terms extended like 20 years. All right, so what happened next? Basically, when wars come, you have a lot of people, and then everything goes back down, and not a whole lot happens between wars. Just before World War II broke out, Rossell, who had been commandant for four years prior, um, earlier, actually, he had been in the um, seminary. He wanted to be a priest. Graduated from seminary in, 19, seminary in 1902 and then joined the Marines instead. Um, but point being that he had, he had a soft spot for these guys. He really wanted them to do good. And he did a lot of good. If you read all of this stuff, he was, he was a good person. So he was here when World War II broke out. Unfortunately, he was a little like Osborne, um, but we'll get to that. So once again, they had to build. So the, that other side of the prison finally got built. Technically, when they made the plans for it, had they built both wings at the same time and it was heralded as the biggest concrete structure in America, and it would have been, but when they finally got around to building it, it was not the same size, it was a whole lot smaller. So it never had that, um, it was never famous for that. So they built the North Wing and that's the finished North Wing. And now it looks like a castle. And then they built the annex and that's the part that I had seen. So I knew, um, I knew that it existed, I didn't know what it was. And the annex doesn't look like the rest of it. But a lot of things moved into the annex and there's a finished one. They had 10,000 books in the library. Men could go up there and get books. They didn't have to be delivered anymore. The New York Public Library was very helpful in supplying books. There's a new auditorium. They're still showing movies all the time. <clears throat> 
They have an infirmary, and from the very beginning, they had a dentist there, and he always had a he had a report. It was really pretty pretty fascinating. Um, <clears throat> a lot of guys came and were better off physically when they left, um, and they finally realized that not everybody needed to be in their cells, and they put them in squad rooms. So the, if you were if you behaved yourself and you were not a threat, we we were not going to run. They put you in squad rooms in the annex. And here's all four sections of the prison. You see the band. Um, Thomas Mott Osborne was a concert pianist. And there's always been music of some kind in the prison. There was a band, there was an orchestra, um, there was a chorus, there's always a bugler. They always talked about the bugler, but, I, but they never talked about what he did, though I assume he was, he was Tattoo and Reveille and whatever else they needed. So there was always a music program um, at, the, at the prison. During World War II, they worked day and night. They got a lot of government contracts. It was the busiest time of the prison ever. Everybody was busy, busy, busy. And that included the people in the cell block and the people who were slated to return, and many did return to active duty, and Rossell made sure that that happened. Um, <clears throat> it was the most productive time of the shipyard, basically, and they did a lot. They sewed uniforms for themselves and for lots of other um, military institutions. They did uh, nets and cargo netting and um, book binding, just all kinds of stuff. And they really lent um, a lot to the war. Toward the end of the war, this is when I signed on to this project. Five U-boats um, surrendered it at the shipyard. They, this was between VE Day and VJ Day. And uh, Donitz, head of the fleet in Germany, right after Hitler had committed suicide, said, you have to surrender in either Portsmouth or Newfoundland. And so they kind of decided what they were going to do. And many, five of them, I think, decided on Portsmouth. And when they came in, basically all hell broke loose. We had just learned about the concentration camps. And this was the first time we'd seen German soldiers. And we knew what they had done to us. And we were none too happy about that. The prison was already filled to capacity. There was no place for the German soldiers. But they put them there anyway. And um, their possessions were stolen, sold, they were beaten. They, it, was, it was not a pretty sight. Security was gravely compromised. Interestingly enough, the very last boat that pulled in, and this, this stopped everything, was U-234. Um, U-234 was on its way to Japan, and in this boat, and uh, Washington, D.C. knew about this boat, and they had been following it. So when it finally landed in Portsmouth, the big, the big guys came down and stopped everything. You didn't read about it in the paper. Everybody went home. When this guy came, they all came down. They wanted this boat. Why did they want this boat? Because he, they had the scientists, the manufacturers, they had all of the equipment that Germany had, the really good equipment. They were headed for Japan. They were going to set up shop there. And had they landed, they probably could have done exactly that. There was a uranium ore on the boat. There were Mr. Schmitz. There was all kinds of equipment. And everybody who could start to put it into production was on that submarine. They had two Jap very skilled Japanese who committed suicide and um, were buried at sea. Everybody said they were on board, but they weren't. Um, so what did they do with this? They came down and they took it and they took everything off this submarine, including the people. And towards the end of World War II, England and Russia and us were all vying for the German scientists. And there, there's a lot of funny stories about that, actually. But we knew that we had something on our hands and we were not going to let it go. We instituted something called the Paperclip Project. And that, there's a name because they put paper clips on. And that was that we, we took these guys and we gave them two and three and four year contracts. We paid them. We brought their 
family over there, but we wouldn't let them go anywhere. You're working for us. They went to White Sands. They went to all of the big places. They exploded their rockets. Werner von Braun came over on this project and, and he was the one that got us to the moon. Um, needless to say, when we found out about this about 20 years later, there was a huge outcry. It's like, you did what? What the Nazis people? So um, very much a double-edged sword. But anyway, so uh, they eventually sunk 234 to the bottom of the ocean, but it was stripped bare. There was nothing left and nobody left. What happened? Um, what ultimately did Roselle in, because he was, he had to retire. I think the head of the shipyard was also disciplined. Everybody was. Um, this guy had been sent to Boston and he broke his glasses and committed suicide. And that was half of it. The other was U-234 um, and everything that was compromised. This is just people. I don't, I don't know if they're guilty or not. I don't know who they are, but that's what they look like back then. And there was a big investigation and uh, a lot of people were disciplined, Roselle among them. And so he had to leave, unfortunately, and it really tarnished his image, like kind of like Osborne did. But up until that point, he was a really good guy. <clears throat> the other reason this was so hard to research because everything was all over the place was up until 1946, it was called the Portsmouth Naval Prison. And after that, it was everything else. And so you go looking for one thing and it wasn't there, it was listed under something else. So it was really very difficult to find what you needed. It was in five different states. I went to um, Maryland and Virginia. When I was at the DC uh, Navy Yard, they told me about, um, what's that? Uh, it's not Guantanamo, what's the other one? What's the, what's the Marine in, in Virginia? Thank you, Quantico. They said that they had all of this stuff in Quantico and they sure did. And so that, then I got a whole bunch of other photographs from, from Quantico. So one thing led to another. All right, we're headed to the end here. This is everything. This is the whole shebang. So this is 191, it's still there. That was the chapel. I don't think it still is. That's the annex. That is, that was the mess hall at the lower reservation. It was a, during the war, it was a classroom. There was an actual classroom there. This was the guardhouse, which would move from down there. So you can see, and this is quarters cube there. How we do it, all right. Oh, don't do that. In 1954, they moved everything. Maybe you heard about this to Camp Langdon. Um, in Newcastle, it, instead it had been an old army base and they rehabbed it and they put the people down there who were slated to go back into the service. And um, they, didn't have, they didn't have fences, they didn't have many guards and they didn't have many rules. And it worked out very well until they ran out of money and then they closed it. <clears throat> and so the population up and down, depending on when there was the Korean War, when there was the uh, Vietnam War, and programs still, there were still a lot of very innovative programs that came into the prison. The very last things they did, well, they just had, I think, the general court marshals. And so they had a lot of um, people who had done more serious things. And so security was increased. They never had a fence around it until after World War II, I think. <laughs> they did have, they did institute Little Siberia. Um, which I heard about from one of the guards. And when you were really, really awful and there's nothing else they could do, they put you in Little Siberia. That's a fence. Um, the guards received training, no matter, as this thing was changing and changing and changing, they received training. And I have this picture and Steve Jennison, who was a guard and helped me with this book a whole lot. And I said to him, what, what are you people doing here? And he told me all about their training that they received and he said, oh, and I'm in that picture. So this was just a shout out to Steve. And it's the visitor center behind it. In 1974, uh, McNamara, right after Nixon was reelected, um, 
supposedly just because they wanted to save money, but other people said it was because uh, Massachusetts didn't vote for Nixon. And so they cracked down and they closed like everything. So we were, we were slated for closing in 1974. And nothing much happened. And so it was vacant until they finally mothballed it. So that's one of the reasons why it's hard to get it back so anybody can visit because a lot of damage was done in those, in those years. This is the picture of when they were trying to sell it. This is the house for sale sign. And then in 19, 2015, I went back and I actually hadn't been there for a while. Um, and it was kind of interesting to see because I had a whole different perspective. In earlier times, they had actually put ivy on the walls. They had ivy covered prison because they thought it looked better. So then they'd haul it all down and then 20 years later, they put it back up again. So this is what it looks like or in 215. Uh, building 191 at that time was still functioning as um, housing somebody or something. Some people say the prison is haunted. And if you go into Portsmouth and you go on the haunted tour, they will tell you that absolutely it is. And don't argue with them because they know. And this is the lower reservation today. Um, and I was actually stunned when I got down there because it was so quiet. And for like 10 years, I had been reading about building this and disciplining that and moving them here and tearing this down and redoing and constant activity. And when I myself got there, it was silent as a tomb, which actually it was. And I thought, oh my goodness, here we are and nothing's going on. It was just the eeriest feeling. And it was like, all right, now you can go back to saying, What's that castle doing in the middle of the river? And that's kind of where we were. So I hope you've learned a little more and you can answer someone when they ask, what's that castle doing in the middle of the river? And if anybody comes from out of town and you want to tell them that um, these people had seawater up to their necks and nobody ever got escaped and Disney did help build, the, well, you go ahead because who's going to know? Nobody, and they're really good stories. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? I have a question. Look the side of the building. You had DISCOM on the top? Yes. Well, I'm just curious. DISCOM, Disciplinary Command. That's what it was called from 1960 to 1974. Okay. I know. I know. Really confusing. Yes. Which story is that that you're interested in? Oh, the escape. Yes. <laughs> that the escape of the prisoners is in my book, but it's also if you want to go to New York Times historical newspapers, it's all over the place. Um, yeah, it was a huge story for a long time. 24? 24? Yeah, pretty sure. Yes? Um, I just wanted to clarify the lower reservation was for people who worked there? Prisoners. prisoners. Yes, water. more prisoners, right. I think the Marines, she asked what the lower reservation was, whether there were people who worked there. The Marines actually, if they had a leftover one, the Marines were there, yeah. Um, but basically it was for the prisoners. And then after Osborne left, they did all kinds of stuff with it. So probably, yeah, you had workers down there after a while. Yeah. Yes. I'm so glad you asked. Everybody always asks that. And I thought uh, Joe would be here today or Gary, because they were going to give me the official word, but they didn't. Um, it's a really good question. From what I have learned, and I have to be really careful here, what I have learned is there is a significant number of people who like it just the way it is, thank you very much. And there's a whole slew of people who wanna open it up and, and preserve it. 
And so there is the yin and the yang here going on. And so right now, as far as I know, nothing except they shrink wrap boats and put them in the lower reservation. Yes. No, they have tried a lot of things. So she asked what happened. Sawtell came in 1999 and wanted to do technology. And I think started with the annex maybe, and they were working in there. And it actually was a pretty good, cause he had done the thing. I think he helped with Wentworth by the sea and some other mills. And he, that's what he did. Basically he rehabbed historic um, buildings, but he died. And after that, nothing, nothing was viable because A, there was a lot of asbestos. You had to go through the shipyard to get there or you had to come by boat. Um, and it was very expensive, I think, probably to get it back into some condition that anybody could walk in it. So no, nothing has been done. A lot of, lot of thought, yes. So during World War II, for example, Prison population. Was it U.S. Navy personnel, or was it Germans and Japanese? Or? You mean uh, during World War II? Yeah. Interesting. You should ask that. Um, in general, the the Navy were the number one. For the most prisoners were from the Navy. They were also from the Marines, and they were also from the Coast Guard. So when I went to, and I'm going to answer your question in one second. So when I went to look for pictures and stuff, that's where they all were. They were in some other aspect of the military. When the Germans came, they didn't stay long. Um, they stayed only about a week or two. And then they sent them to prisoner of war camps in the South, generally speaking. So they were, they were not there long. Does that answer? Yes. Yes, mostly U.S. personnel, but good question. <laughs> I've heard that. I have no idea, but I mean, why not? I mean, you know, <laughs> in Thomas Mott Osborne's day, there was no, you read the menu, there was no sugar anywhere. And all of a sudden I'm reading Thomas Mott Osborne's menu. There are Tootsie Rolls and Lorna Dunes and cakes and ice cream. And I'm thinking something here's changed. It was, it was hilarious, but I don't know. <laughs> Is somebody over here? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. He was explaining why the Coast Guard was there. I always wondered. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I couldn't really tell from your comments. You know, it seems like there's ambiguity in other historians. What is, how is it really viewed his work? I mean, was he effective or was he just a pro leader or what? He was effective for the time he was there. And I think over the long span of his life, he really changed what happened in prisons. Um, it depends who you read. I think he was very controversial, but I also think that his legacy is significant, um, that he did make lasting changes, but he alienated a whole bunch of people along the way. Does that answer your question? Are there books that you know, really go into that history? Oh, yes. There's, yes. If you go to Auburn, um, there's a whole library there, and I think Cornell has the entire Osborne family. Yes. Yes, you can you can read a lot. If you just go on Google, you can find it. Start. Yeah. It's extensive. Why do they call it the Portsmouth prison and the Portsmouth shipyard? Good question. Because when it was built, Maine was not a state. So it was built in Maine, but the post office was in Portsmouth. So if you wanted to send anything to the prison, you had to send it to Portsmouth. So it, that's how it got its name. When in fact, it was in Maine. And so when Maine became a state, then they claimed it. Well, really good question.
Yeah. Yes. Is that because was Maine wasn't Maine part of Massachusetts at one point? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. You know your history. Yeah. And so it took them a while to become a state. So that's why. Yeah. And then they had the big Supreme Court thing, and they said, "Yeah, it's in Maine." Yes. How do you get on the tour, or how did I? You mean when I took those pictures? <laughs> well, I, it's a really good question. I started my research at the archives at the shipyard, and they were open on Thursdays, and I was there every single Thursday for months, and they knew who I was. And so when I needed something, um, I had an in. I guess <laughs> sometimes I bought cake, you know. <laughs> but a really good question, yeah. Um, Linda online is um, wondering if um, if you would if you could possibly see the prison one day becoming like condo, um, or if um, there is anything that is protecting the prison from getting demolished right now? Like, would someone develop it and make it into residential? Is there anything preventing that? Or like... <laughs> yeah, it is on the National Register and NAVFAC, Naval Facilities, did a beautiful write-up of its historical significance, yes. Um, I don't know. It would take a whole lot of money and a whole lot of ingenuity. I would totally agree with you. Condos would be super. It's just, if you've looked inside or seen any of the pictures inside, it's pretty grim. It's pretty grim. But yeah, um, it's a great idea. And I don't know that anybody has either the will or the money to do so. Unless there's this big outpouring and you all, you know, get together and demand that it happens. I have someone else that's asking, um, I heard that the prison held only prisoners that were in bad that nowhere else would have held them. Is that true? <laughs> Sometimes yes. Sometimes yes. They had they had the worst of the worst. Toward the end, I think. Um, when they sent everybody who was going to be sent back into active duty elsewhere and everybody who wasn't stayed there. So yeah, we, they, for a period we had, they had the really bad actors. That is, that is true. And they stayed there only four years and they went through the system. And if they did not uh, redeem themselves in those four years, they went to Leavenworth. So that, yeah, there was some, there was some bad stuff there. There must be, you know, all of that stuff is in National Archives Record Administration, Boston, which is in Waltham. And before they started making social security numbers private, everybody's social security number is listed in these books. And I'm looking up people and I had sent to um, Chicago and said, do you know who this person is? Because I had their social security number. Um, yeah. So I suspect if I wanted to go back and look, I could. It's available. Yeah. You mentioned that O'Neill. Frank O'Neill. Is he the only one that successfully escaped? No. Uh, 28. No, he wasn't. Um, November 11th, 11, 11, 11, whenever that was, 10 people escaped that day. Yeah, um, they did escape. They, they got creative after a while. So yeah, there were a number of people. And there's, I don't know if any of you know about the shipyard and know about Ivan. If you, if you knew about the prison, there was a, an Ivan who escaped not once, but twice and just turned the place upside down. And I sent to Chicago because I had all this stuff. And I said, where is this guy? They had no record of him. So, yeah, you gone, gone, gone. And you're probably, the, yeah, okay, unless we have some here. Yes. 
The largest explosion in the world before the atomic bomb happened right in the middle of that picture. Right there. Did you know that? I did not. The largest explosion in the world blew up Poland began point. Oh, Henderson's point. Henderson's point. Yes. Yes, you're totally right. He's totally right. It was the, yes, it was the largest explosion ever. Yeah, the Henderson's Point came into the, into the river and it was blocking shipping. And so they dynamited the heck out of it and they sold tickets. And yeah, it was, it was huge. And it took them like 10 years to clean it up. Yeah, you're right. That was something, that was something. Yeah. All right, uh, you've been sitting here a long time. Um, oh, more questions, all right. Yes, there was a movie film there. Yeah, and I, and I don't remember the name of it, but I watched it. Yes, there was. Yes, You're, you are. Yes. Is the building considered historical? Is it registered as something or not? It is registered. It's an, on the historic register. And so I suspect if somebody really wanted to press the point, they could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, really good point. Yes, I have a card I can give out. Yeah, I'll stay around because what I learned is you have a lot to tell me about your experiences with the prison. Somebody knows somebody and knows somebody and they you want to tell me about it. And that's how I learn a whole bunch of this stuff. So yeah, uh, if you want my card, I'll give it to you. And if you want a book, um, I'll eventually get back there. You've been a great audience. Thank you so much for coming out on this hot night.